Welcome back to the Weekly Transfer Show as part of the Dynamo Podcast Network on YouTube. Head over there, smash that subscribe and bell notification button. Audio versions of the show are available through Podbean, Spotify, Apple iTunes, wherever you pick up your audio shows, you will find us there. Just search the Dynamo Podcast Network or the Upper Tier Football Show and you will find us there. Joining me today as always, my partner on the Transfer Show on a weekly basis, Dean, how we doing my man? Come here better, no, back with a bang last night, Arsenal, oh, sorry, I mean Banter FC are back. Absolutely, what a crazy game and such a poor performance by Arsenal. Just, you just, aside from Arsenal being absolutely awful and some really standout miserable performances, um, not going to mention any names, Ben White, um, just the, the atmosphere last night was unbelievable. I'm glad that the season started off with Brentford at home for the first game because it was just... The camera went to a guy in, the, I think, the 89th minute. He was just 70 years of age and he was bawling his eyes out. And I was like, we're fucking back. It was just, it was, it was, it was amazing. You just know, like, everybody felt their text you saying, how good is it to have the football back? It just didn't take me eyes off the game. The whole night. It, was, it was brilliant. Yeah, and a beautiful stadium as well. Hats off to Brentford. Lovely stadium that they put together there. So we wish them well this season. We hope they do really well, except when they visit Anfield or when we visit there as Liverpool <laughs> fans. But, um, I suppose on the back of last night on our transfer show, let's start. Uh, the Gunners have pulled out of a move for Sheffield United's Aaron Ramsdale. Um, no agreement on the fee. I think they're looking for about 30 million. I'm looking at last night and I'm thinking, Gunners, go spend that 30 million quick. <laughs> I'm looking at last night and I'm going back to my comment last week about how Arsenal decided to sell Emiliano Martinez. Other than Alisson, he's I'm not being boy saying Allison's the best goalkeeper in the league, but Martinez for the last couple of years has been outstanding. And you're looking at Leno last night, and if you're an Arsenal fan, you're pulling whatever hair you have left out of your head. Um, yeah. Because it's just a polar opposites. Martinez is everything you want in a keeper. Big, strong, vocal, great shot stopper, plays mental games with the attackers. Leno, he's a shadow of a good goalkeeper. It's amazing, isn't it, when you think that like all those great Arsenal teams down through the years were built on such great goalkeepers and such strong defence. You know, when we think of Adams and Bold and Keown and Saul Campbell and David Seaman and Len- Lehman, uh, Lens- Lehmans and all this, you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. just, it's incredible that they find themselves in a position like this where they practically need, I know they've brought in Ben White and I know he's going to take time to bed in and stuff like that, but certainly doesn't look at like the 50 million valuation. Graham Potter must be laughing from ear to ear at this stage. But I just think it's, um, it, it, it's a shame to see them like this. And I know like they're, they're, they're a rival and stuff like that, but still yeah. it's, um, it's, it's a serious fall from grace. And the fact that they find themselves in need of a, a new goalkeeper and practically a whole new back line, assuming ben, ben White has come in, obviously, so around him, you know what I mean? It's a real bad situation that they find themselves in. And that could get really, really bad, really, really quick. On the background of that, I mean, there's a bit of an Arsenal feel to this today. Um, Newcastle signing Joe Willock, an attacking midfielder, absolutely sensational player, had a great season on loan at Newcastle last year. Right um, season, yeah. Going to continue that on now. Here again is another player that would have been perfect for that match last night, and yet they're letting him go. And I think the fee is like twenty five million. Um, especially when, especially when you look at like situations like last night, where like you look at Liverpool's injury crisis last year, um, and that's all I'm going to mention about. But you look at last night, missing Abamyang and Lacazette, Smith Rowe. I felt sorry for him last night because. Balligan, you know, he is going to be an exceptional player. But to be just dropped in the deep end last night, you know, as the the, the main man up top, uh, Martinelli, we know, is an exceptional player. But, you know, it's a different ball game when you're coming in on the back of a few good results for the team or, you know, you're coming in with a cup game and you pick up a couple of goals. But first game of the season, needing to get, like, hit the ground running. You know, um, Smith Rowe was the best player last night. Bad decisions from Arteta. But then you look at a decision like this, Willock being allowed to live. That's, again, we've been talking a lot about Arsenal all summer about the needs of rebuild and maybe ship out one or two players that they can make money off. And I'm, I'm scratching my head looking at that, at this deal and I'm saying to myself, this club has gone backwards, like, quite fast. And I'm sticking by me, me um, what I said last week, that Arteta is going to be the first manager to be sacked. I think he sat beside Pep for a long, long time and they brought him in... Um, 
relatively cheap and they thought that he was going to come in having picked up everything that he could from Pep and it's just failing miserably. The, as you said about uh, Ben White, the overinflated price as well. He's not. Gonna, I don't think he's going to settle at all this season. I said to my dad last night, I think that the pressure is going to tell with him. It's all coming to playing in the Brighton team and, you know, nobody's expecting it to be top of the league or be fighting for top. Yeah, absolutely. I think letting Joe Willock go was a major mistake there. He's good attacking midfielder, stuff like that. And the guy with a knife a goal as well has goals in him. At a time where Arsenal struggled to find goals, even with Lacazette and Aubameyang in the side, they're not really firing at all. Um, just another piece of Arsenal news, obviously, looks like they're trying to hijack the Roma deal for Tammy Abraham. I think that would be a sensational move. I think they should go all out to get Tammy Abraham in because I think... I think Project Lacazette and I think Project Obama Yang is going to come to an end real, real soon. Um, and I think Tammy Abraham could be the guy that would slot in there and probably a decent price. You'd probably get him, what, the 35, 40 million? Wouldn't be too yeah, bad well, an investment. The, the money that they get for Willock should just go straight into that deal. It's as simple as that. Last night showed that, you know, without Lacazette or Obama Yang, that there isn't much firepower there. So, you know, Abraham has scored goals in the championship, he scored goals at Chelsea. It's it's a no-brainer. You need a goal scorer. You can't hang around, especially after losing the fourth game of the season. It has to be done now. Can't be haggling over the price. Chelsea aren't gonna book up. Young if Ben White is going for fifty million, here's Tammy Abraham, young English player, you know, scores goals in the Premier League, prove himself a filler in the championship. Just go out, make the offer that they want and get it done before next week. Yeah, absolutely. Um let's have a quick chat about Harry Kane. I mean, obviously. Tottenham are playing Man City um, this weekend. So, obviously, there was no deal that <coughs> happened prior to that, you know. But um, it sounds like um, Spurs are lining up a move for Fiorentina's uh, Dustan Flahovic um, as a replacement for Harry Kane. Do you see the Kane deal going through? What are you thinking on it? I'm 50-50 on this, Noel. I, I, I don't know. Um, we heard reports yesterday that Man City are uh, preparing 150 million uh, 150 million pound um, bid and I just if they do I, there's no way sports can afford to say no to it you know he's paid his dues there he's carried them through how many seasons now I think if you take Harry Kane out, Harry Kane's goals out of sports God knows where that club would be um, and I just think you know as, as tough as it is to let your the golden child of sports go Money like 150 to start the rebuild, you know, let him go. At the end of the day, as I said, he's proved his point at, at sports. You know, he wants to go and win trophies. He's not got, not got long left. And I believe that the older he gets, the more um, frail the, the ankles become and, you know, injuries and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm 50-50 on it. But the, the, the more I think about it, I do, I do see it happening. And, and I just think that it, it's, it's too much money to turn your, your nose up to. And yeah. play like Duke Sam Vlahovic, bring him in, get him settled, you know. Um, I do think he'll score goals in the Premier League. He can be the main target man at sports. I think they'll bring in probably another striker, probably obviously not as, as expensive, not as experienced, and kind of just fed him in this season as well, probably for, for next season. But um, yeah, the more I think, I do, I do think it's going to happen. But it's just again, the, the money like is it's fucking crazy. crazy yeah. Nice war chest for Nuno, though, going in there as a new manager. Gives him an opportunity to build a team kind of in his own vein, if you like. Um, let's move on. This Koundé deal with Chelsea um, seems like it's more or less there or thereabouts, but they are negotiating on the clause, the release clause. Apparently, it's believed to be about €80 million. Euros. Chelsea are looking to spend about €60, €65 million Euros on this, so they're kind of trying to meet somewhere in the middle on it. Um, be a sensational signing for Chelsea. Ah, hundred percent. You look at the, the back, the five that they have there. They can play the three or they can play the five, and he's going to come in. There won't be as much pressure on him, even with a big price tag. Um, you know, you got Thiago Silva there, you've got Rudiger there, you've got Chilwell there, you've got Reese James there. Um, you know they're not short of talent. Um, and as I said, like the, the price, eighty million. You know, it's it seems to be a lot of money, but again, I do think that uh, he'll come in and he he'll bet in quickly. Um, very, very good player. It's going to be an exceptional signing for um, for Chelsea. And uh, yeah. yeah, as we said last week, the season is going to be uh, a bit crazy with these squads that are being built. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I suppose the main news for the whole transfer window has been this whole saga with Lionel Messi. Uh, but it was put to bed this week where this gigantic move to PSG. Um, I don't know what I don't know what my thinking is on this. You know what I mean? It's just the abundance of riches they have at PSG, the, the bottomless pit of money. Um, and cryptocurrency. Yeah, and it just seems like, you know, 70 million euros or something after taxes the deal for the two years, but I'm sure that doesn't take into account image rights and add-ons and, you know, that large fee he charges for basically having a chat um, and all those other kind of add-ons. But, um, this, this is um, PSG making a huge move towards the Champions League, isn't it? They have to be favourites for the Champions League. Ramos coming in, Hakimi, Genie Wijnaldum, Donnarumma. Like, you're happy enough. I think any team in world football would be happy with that transfer window. And then you get Messi. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> they, they seem to have justified the financial background to getting Messi and being able to keep Neymar, Messi and Mbappe and you're thinking to yourself football looks doomed if you're a neutral and you just love football you don't necessarily have a team you're looking at this and it's like the best fucking explosion in your pants in football history and then you're thinking to yourself on the other hand teams that don't have money may as well just give up Um, then you, you heard of like the, the 25 million in cryptocurrency just as a gift um, you know, and I was talking to my brother about during the week at how bad the French league is and Lille won the league last year, but they've had to get rid of X amount of players. The manager left about a week after they won the league. So it's kind of a formality that they're going to win the league, probably uh, in second gear, which means you've gone full throttle at the chance. If they don't win the Champions League this year, um. I think they should just fold as a club. Well, they're not really long in existence, are they? 1970, I think they were formed. But they, they, for me, they, they have to win the Champions League. I, I'm, I'm putting them out there as favourites with um, Man City and Liverpool. But uh, th- 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 this has to be the main goal this year. Do you know what's interested me in the whole of this move? Um, is how Maurizio Pochettino was going to handle it and how his management skill how he's going to keep all these players. Because we talk about those players, and then we haven't even mentioned the Cardi. We haven't even mentioned Angel Di Maria. We haven't even mentioned Marquinhos and all these other players that, have, that are already there that have to be handled. And then the players that you mentioned that have just been dropped in on top of that, basically. You know what I mean? So I'm going to be... It's really intriguing for me to see how Pochettino handles that whole situation as a manager, you know, because he's, you know, he's a young enough manager himself as well, you know what I mean? And uh, to be dropped into that melting pot as well, where you're trying to manage such huge superstars, you know what I mean? Um, no, gonna, if I'm, if I'm honest, if I, yeah, if I'm honest, I don't think he does manage the situation. I think the, the, I think they'll win the league, I think, as I said, it's like a, a second, in second gear. So once that team is winning, Nobody's going to bat an eyelid in his direction. As you said, how is he going to manage the situation with so many big egos there? You talk of Ramos, the front three. Um, no, but you know, what, you know what I'm thinking. Let's say in a high-level Champions League game, let's say you get a PSG versus, say, for example, Man City. Yeah. Um, and it's not quite going PSG's way, say. And he has to make a change up front. And let's say he wants... Let's, Exactly. Who do you take off and how do you manage that adjustment? Because I assume the three boys are going to assume that they're just going to be playing together every minute of every day. Um, yeah, well, you look and you look at, yeah, as you said, like when you play the likes of Man City, it's a game of chess. Hmm. And if you, get your, if you get your selection wrong, you could be two or three down. Like, when we, for instance, when Liverpool played Man City um, in the Champions League there a few years back, and Liverpool were 3-1 three, three up or 3 nil up after a short space of time because Pep Toy is going to come to Anfield on a European night Anfield absolutely rocking and just play his brand of football when we, we've seen over the years it doesn't, it doesn't quite work that way um, on a Champions League night at Anfield regardless of what, what the opposition is um, and I completely understand that and maybe that is regardless of how well they're doing in the league once he starts if there's signs of him pissing off either of them three that's when the hierarchy start looking and saying, well, you know, 
we've got the three best attackers in world football, in their opinion, at the club. You're on Mauricio Positino. You've won nothing in your career. So I think the problem here is you, because they won't want to rock the boat with any of them three. You yeah, know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. So, um, yeah, it remains to be seen. It, it, it'll be intriguing now to see once the Champions League does, does start and who they get in the group. Um, let's move on then from it, but definitely um, a very intriguing um, situation coming this season to us. You know? Andreas Pereira, um, favouring a permanent transfer out of United. I think United were trying to tie down a loan deal or something like that. Um, not very interested in the loan deal. Wants a permanent transfer. Yeah, I think it's well overdue at this stage. I think he probably should have gone last year. Um, I know Everton are keen, for Rito Romano came out and said that Everton are keen on it, but I think that's only on loan. Um, I, I I think the the best option for both parties is is to sell him on get get whatever money you can back for him. Um, if any, um, yeah, why why waste another year of your career? You know, if he goes out on loan and doesn't quite work out, then you're back at United, and the next summer is trying to get him out on loan again. Um, just he's not exactly young anymore. You know, he's been at United for what, four years now. Mm. He's not really settled in. He's not really got a long run of games, even when players were out injured. So. I don't understand the, the the thought process behind the the loan out. Now I do understand with, with the Ahmed Diallo. I understand the whole thought process of the loan out there because he's only he's literally only a kid. But with Pereira, you know, a top by now if, if he was going to establish himself in the team, it would have been done by now, and he hasn't. So you know, get whatever money you can for him and just let him move on. Yeah, Chelsea looking to move on back Yoko. I think that's without a shadow of a doubt, isn't it? I can't see him fitting in anywhere into this Chelsea team at any stage. Um, AC Milan and Napoli very interested in him, but it looks like Bordeaux have entered the market as well. Um, Ian was talking. Um, Ian was talking about Joan. I, I don't know your woman's name that deals with all the transfers, but you Marina. know, the, Marina. Marina. Yeah, the the, the sell on uh, the, the money that Chelsea are re- recouping from players that they're selling on is it's it's a, you'd be envious of it because I know they've they've brought in copious amounts of players over the years and they probably have about 60 players they want loan and all but the business that they do you know aside from some people being bitter regarding the money that they can spend on players if you look at the track record over the years of the money that they're rekindling you know it's fantastic business but for Bakayoko you know this never really worked out for him um, surprised that Bordeaux coming in maybe like to, to, to get him back to, to, to France but you know AC Milan and Napoli um, AC Milan Champions League so I'd be really, really interested to see if he goes back there. Um, but Napoli, Napoli would be a good move too, you know. Both aren't really great leagues, not necessarily the French league either. But uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see where, where he goes. When he came into the Premier League, I thought he was going to be a standout performer for Chelsea. But another one of those big names that came in and just couldn't handle the pace of the Premier League. Um, they also wrapped up Lukaku this week, um, which is a fantastic move, exceptional player. <laughs> but... Um, you know, again, I looked at that Super Cup there during the week and I seen them play really, really well with lovely patterns of play in the first half. But in the second half, was a massive yeah, was drop all off. Yeah. And um, just the way it opened up in midfield as well, I hadn't seen that happen before for Chelsea. The way they, they were porous in midfield, the way the way Villarreal could attack down the flanks and through the middle and everything. Um, and it's still... It was almost- yeah, it was almost like the first half they were playing at a, hot, a quicker tempo than they usually play. Mm. And it was like they burned, I'm not saying they did burn out, maybe they just took the foot off the pedal a bit, but the, the first half, as you said, everything was quick, one, one touch pass and two touch pass at, at most. Lovely players in, in, in around the back, you didn't can't take them what he usually does and the defence was, was really tight, they were really sharp and then the second half, I don't know whether it was Chelsea just took the foot off the pedal or they burnt out or Villarreal just upped their tempo but it was polar opposites it was Chelsea first half Villarreal second half and I, I know I, I, I completely agree does Lukaku fit into that you know is he going to play two up top or will it be Lukaku through the middle um, next week uh, next week will be re- really telling um, I, I just have a feeling that he's kind of running up next week and you know set a precedent for, for what's ahead and I just if if it's Ben White and your man Marty mm. against Lukaku next week, mm. as Mark put in the, the WhatsApp group, that meme, your man dragging the defender around. What's definitely going to... what what's your thinking on Timo Werner? I mean, I just I'm not too sure about him and I don't know whether Tuchel is gonna have the patience for him. He just no. seems all over the place. 
Um, he's, he's like a headless chicken. It's like he, someone gave a headless chicken a load of fucking speed or something. Um, you know, for 10, 15 minutes, he's doing what you want him to do. He's hanging around between the, the two centre halves and you know, he's, he's trying to pull in behind and look for the ball through the, around, the, around the back. And the next minute he's out on the wing and he's just running around in circles. And I think last season, I know Ian was saying that, you know, he, he created a lot of chances and he, like, you know, he did get, he was involved in a lot of, in, in a lot of um, goal scoring opportunities and all. And I did say coming towards the end of the season, if Chelsea were to pull the trigger and, you know, go out and try and get a, like a more prolific striker, which they have done with Lukaku, I, I, I can't see a, a team where the two of them play, not when you have, when I know Soyet's got injured, but Havertz is going to step up, Pulisic is going to step up, Mason Mount is the first name on the team sheet, and I just don't see a place for him in the team anymore. And I did say this, that, that I don't think Tuchel will have the patience. Mm. And, you know, if you're bringing in Lukaku, 100 million, and he's going to be your, 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 your main talisman, and I do think he will be their main talisman, I think he's going to set the Premier League alight this year. Yeah. But, just don't see where where enough fits in at all. Yeah, well, I mean, the boys, the boys have made the point on a number of shows that like he has to feed off, he has to feed off a, a big front man. You know what I mean? And and I kind of get that when you look back at his time in the Bundesliga, but I don't see Lukaku coming in to become a provider. Do no. you? I see Lukaku coming in who's on a hunting down a golden boot and get 25, 30 goals a season. Not to be a layoff merchant. If you want them, if you want them to play off a big man, you would bring in Andy Carroll. You know what I mean? That's yeah. someone who knocks the ball down or takes the ball in and lays it off to you. But now I, I think it's going to be Lukaku up top, and I think it's going to be Havertz yeah. behind with Mason Mount and Pulisic and Mason yeah. Mount and Zoya. So just don't see him fitting in there at all. Yeah, see, it's just a weird one as well. When I look at them play, I can see what Mount and Havertz and Jorginho and Ziyech and Pulisic and all these players, I see what they're trying to do. And then somewhere out here, then you have Timo Werner, who's just running around on the outskirts, kind of trying to figure out what it's all about. I seen there, even the other night there in the Super Cup, a number of balls that Havertz played in, they were absolutely exceptional balls. And they just went on the same wavelength at all. You know what I mean? And I'm just thinking, are we going to see a start to the season again, the same as a kind of last season, where he's kind of like, he's nearly there, but just not there. And are they going to have the patience? Because I was saying to Ian on the Chelsea Roar as well, if he converted 70% of those chances that he missed, Chelsea would be challenging. Chel Chelsea would be challenging for a title. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's that's the biggest concern. You know? If if Bernard had to took seventy percent of them chances, they wouldn't have needed to go out on Boy Lukaku this summer. And that's why they went out and spent a hundred million to bring in someone who will con uh, convert them chances. The back of the as, head, yeah. as you as you said, like as bad as they were under Lampard in the first half of the season. If Tuchel, like if they had had a prolific goal scorer in the second half of the season, they probably could have finished second. You know because Man City had pulled away so. I'm intrigued to see where the rest of the transfer window goes because for me, like Werner is a, is a great player. I just don't think he's going to be at that level. You know, maybe like if he gets two or three goals in, in, in the bag and, you know, gets a bit of momentum and a bit of confidence. But I just, I don't, just don't see where that's going to come from because Lukaku, was, Lukaku will just bulldoze through the middle. He's not going to be holding the ball up unless it's really, really has to be laid off and there's an open goal or does, does that, like, the chance is better. But we've seen with Lukaku last year, when he gets the ball, it's head down and it's just at the goal. I want the goals myself. And with Havertz behind him, just, I know Ian, Ian won't want to admit it, but if he sits down and thinks about it and he is honest about it, it's just not going to work out with the two of them up top. Yeah, we shall see. Anyway, Shakiri to Leon, 12 million. Yeah, I thought we got a bit more now. Well, considering they made the opening bid of four million, I was like, yeah. that's bla that's blasphemy, you know. Um twelve million is good business. Um, I'm hoping that it gets done now in the next few days. We did talk about it uh, last week saying that there seemed to be a U turn and that he was staying, but I do think that Klopp wants two players in before the transfer window closes and it, and the only way we get them in is if Shakiri and Origi go. Um it looks like Nat Phillips could go too, which we'll touch on in the Shankly sessions as well. And there's a few few things out there opening up in the Premier League for him, which I'm delighted about. Um, didn't want the same goal, but look, as I said, we touched on it in Shankly sessions. But with regard to Shakiri, um, you know, came up with some excellent moments. One of the standout performers in that Barcelona game that the corner taken quickly at night. And um, best of luck to him in the future. And you know, who who knows? <laughs> now we we might see him down Anfield on the Champions League night. Uh, 
somewhere soon. And yeah, as I said, best of luck. Thanks for the service. Yeah, excellent. Um, you touched on Ahmad earlier, going out on loan from United. Um, I think this is a good move because although he's come in and he looks like an exceptional talent, I think he's just a little bit lightweight at the moment for the Premier League and the intensity of it. Yeah, hundred percent. You look at um, Harvey Elliott. You look at Curtis Jones. Um, Curtis Jones looks like a he's had to put it on a lot, you know. Um, and I'm sure wherever he goes with United, because they do definitely see him for someone down two or three years down the line where he's going to come in. He's an exceptional player. Um, but I just think it's too soon for him at the moment. And yeah. then when you have to like agreeing with Rashford and um, Sancho ahead of you, you know, it would be nice for him to stay there, you know, and play the odd game here, there and everywhere. But if the season goes in the same pattern as last season, he's not going to get that many chances unless it comes down to the last few games of the season and there's nothing to play for. So send him out on loan, you know, get him under a strict programme where he's to put on a bit of muscle. And uh, yeah, I'm sure United fans are... are, are intrigued to see where he does go and like excited for the future and because he's going to be a phenomenal player and there's no doubts about it absolutely and of course we couldn't round out the transfer window with anything else than a four-year deal for big Virgil van Dijk taking him out to Liverpool till 2024 <laughs> yeah we talked about last week the spine of the team um excellent you news know, best in the business don't care what anyone says from any other team. Ruben Diaz is going to be put to the sword this season. We'll see that last year was just a case of the best in the business wasn't around, and that's why the spotlight was on you. Um, couldn't be happier. And now we're expecting now in the next few days, Hendo's three-year deal to be signed and Mo Salah to be the most um or the, the highest paid player in Liverpool history. So uh, we'll get touch those on them. We'll yeah, touch we'll touch on them in the we'll Shankly, session. Shankly sessions, but say right to now. say. It's the reason why on the transfer show I haven't been getting too upset about Liverpool's business at the market because I think they've been doing exceptional work on the foundation in the background as well. So that's why I'm encouraged. And as you said, I think one or two uh, signings will potentially come in if we can move a couple of guys out. But again, great to be tying these guys down on the spine of the team and we will touch on them in the Shankly sessions. Dano, as always, a pleasure talking about transfers on a weekly basis we got two weeks ago we'd like to remind our viewers we're going to be doing a special youtube live for the final day of the transfer window we're going to be doing the, we're going to be covering the last two hours and we're going to be recapping all the transfer shows and all the big transfer and loan news as it unfolds in that two-hour session we'll be bringing loads of guys on all the monday mashup heads will be jumping on of course to give us their views opinion and gossip and if anything breaking news, we'll be on to show that again. Golden toys at the ready. Golden toys, man. Have your white shorts blazer and golden <laughs> toys ready. This is going to be a lot of fun. And we will talk to you again next week. Cheers, pal. See you later, Noilers. Take care.